First of all, I want to express our thanks to the Gloryland Band for enriching our services last week and this week. Gloryland Band, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds so good. Well, let me say good morning and welcome to each and every one of you this morning. And all of you who are online, we're glad that you have joined us for our morning worship service. I greet you this morning in the name of God our Father, Christ our Savior, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, our comforter, counselor, and our guide. I am delighted that you have joined us for this Father's Day Sunday and for this Freedom Weekend. To all of our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, stepfathers, mentors, role models, and nurturers who have given so much to those who walk in the path that you have carved out for us, I personally want to say thank you for all that you've done. In just a few days, talking about Father's Day, in just a few days I will become another grandfather, Paul Paul, again. And uh, <laughs> this will be the fourth time that uh, I'll become a grandfather. It will be two girls and two boys. And uh, God give me strength, please. I, uh, so I solicit your prayers as we prepare to welcome baby Natasha. In, in any day now, and uh, was waiting for that phone call any, at any moment. Don't you know it will come in the middle of the night? But anyway, we wait, baby Natasha, and I just ask that you pray as the Hayes family be prepares to welcome her. Today, as we are rounding the bend, headed into the home stretch of our current sermon series, Faith We Sing, if you haven't been able to tell it by now, I get excited and I get pumped up when we dust off the old hymns and we sing the songs that so many of us sang when we began our journey of faith. Last week, I spoke of the euphoria that, that unconsciously seeps into our souls and our spirits when we revive those memories from way back when, when we uh, trot out that tapestry of, me of memories. And whether you know it or not, those hymns will stay with us for the rest of our lives. It will never, never leave us. But this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to just take the time to look at some of the amazing stories that have given birth to these hymns. If we think the songs are beautiful and inspiring and wonderful, you should hear some of the stories that made these songs possible. Not only are they awe-inspiring, but once you hear how these hymns came to be, it will enhance your appreciation the next time you sing it, even more so. And so that's why I call today's brief message, Amazing Hymns, Amazing Stories. Let's pray. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory, I sing the new, new song, t'will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. Oh, I love to tell the story, t'will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. You know, that hymn prayer that I've just 
recite it for you, is a song that most of us have heard all of our lives. But can you believe that this song was written in a time of illness and distress when the songwriter herself was not able to even share or tell her story? It's amazing. Her name was Catherine Hanke, better known as Kate. She was the daughter of a prosperous British banker and grew up in the Anglican church in a stylish London suburb, but was inspired by the Methodist revival of John and Charles Wesley. You would be amazed at how many of the hymns we sing have some roots within the Methodist revival of John and Charles Wesley. Well, Catherine Hanks, at a young age, started a Bible class for girls in her neighborhood. And by the age of 18, just 18, she went to London to teach Bible classes to what they call factory girls, young women who worked on assembly lines and in factories in teeming London, who probably no doubt did not know anything about faith or religion or even Jesus. So she went to London to teach these factory girls. But in her early 30s, she became seriously ill. And doctors told her that she needed a year of rest, of bed rest. So she was forbidden, denied the opportunity to continue teaching her Bible class. And during her long, slow recovery, she wrote this hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. She wrote it in the form of a poem that had, get this, over a hundred verses in the song. Like I say, it was a long, slow recovery. <laughs> Bob Horton, I don't know who edits hymns, but thank God for people who edit hymns. It, anyway, she wrote over a hundred verses and eventually... Kate recovered, went back to teaching her Bible classes for many years, and when she became unable because of her age to continue teaching the factory girls, she went out and started a prison ministry in London and passed away at the age of 77, which at that time was considered a very long, fruitful life. Catherine Hankey had a story to tell. And it began at a young age and followed her all through her life. But the thing that I find so remarkable is that this hymn, I love to tell this, was written at a time when she couldn't tell the story. You see, that's how hymns are born a variety of events and, and circumstances always go, goes into the composition of the music we sing. And, and that's what makes the stories. Many times a hymn writer will, will have an experience, a unique experience, a spiritual experience. Or that person might have an encounter with God. Or there may be some hardship or trial that has been overcome that inspires a hymn. But that's the genesis of most of the hymns that we sing. These are inspiring songs. And when you begin to look behind the words as to what brought these precious gifts that have been handed down to us into being, you realize that you can never sing these songs again after hearing the story the same way you did before. You know, at some point, all of us become collectors of things, of, of, of stuff. Some people collect magnets to go on refrigerator doors. Some people collect cups or dishes or whatever, all sorts of memorabilia. I collect books of hymns. 
And over the years, I, I have received countless blessings. I've got about 100, 120 of these books of hymns that I've collected over the years. And, and I've received countless blessings uh, as I've researched uh, these, these many, many songs of faith. Uh, I brought one with me today. One of my most treasured hymn books is this one. I know you can't see it. It's, it's, it's a Methodist hymnal that was, uh, that was published in 1878. 1878 by the Methodist Episcopal North Church. And as with many hymns for the first hundred years or so, the first one is O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. That's the hymn that we, that's number one in this. And you know, as I, I look through this hymn book, I now know why people wore glasses during that time because the print is so small, I've got to get right to it to read it. But, but this is one of my treasures, 1878, and I have quite a few that go to the early uh, uh, 1900s, and et cetera, but the Methodist hymnal of that year. But here are a few interesting facts you need to know about the hymns that you may not know. For instance, the hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, was written in just one day by Edward Mott. Edward Mott. He grew up in a non-Christian home. He writes of his childhood years, so ignorant was I that I did not know there was a God. That's how he grew up. But he became a Christian, an ordinary laborer, and he got up one morning, true story, and decided that he would write some words about what it meant to be, be a Christian. And so, by the end of the day, by the end of the day, he was singing these words in a neighbor's home. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Just one day. And that experience was so powerful that Edward Mote became a Baptist preacher. The one I just mentioned a moment ago, Oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, was written by Charles Wesley, as we know, on the anniversary, the first anniversary of his conversion. About two weeks ago, you remember the song, And Can It Be? Well, that was the song that he wrote on his, his conversion. When he was converted in 1738, he wrote that song, And Can It Be? That was the first. And so one year later, he, he wanted to re write a renewal, something to renew that conversion. And it all came about in a conversation with a man by the name of Peter Bowler. You may, you may know that name. He was a Moravian Christian. And the Moravians really influenced the Wesley brothers. But in a conversation with Peter Bowler, Wesley overheard Bowler say, had I a thousand tongues, I would praise God with them all. And by that chance remark, Wesley conceived the idea of this hymn Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And as I said, it graced Methodist hymnals for nearly a hundred years as number one. And, and he wrote, get this, he wrote 18 stanzas of it. And it's only when you get to the seventh stanza do you find the words, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. He was a prolific writer. You know, I just realized if we sang all hundred verses of Catherine Hankey's song, uh, I love to tell the story, and we sang all 18 verses of Wesley's song, it's a really good Sunday. That's, that'll fill a whole day. 
But he, he told it just like, and, and it's in your Methodist hymn, and they'll have, you'll have about 17 verses of it in the Methodist hymnal, and he told it just like it was. And one of the verses goes like this, murderers and all ye hellish crew, ye sons of lust and pride, believe the Savior died for you. That, that was Wesley, oh, 4,000 tons, and he wrote it. And again, thank God for the people who edit music. Wesley needed something to do, I believe. Anyway, I digress. Take the case of Annie Sherwood Hawks. 37 years old, living in Brooklyn, New York, in the year 1872, a housewife. She got up one morning and decided that she would put some words on a piece of paper. She was doing her housework and, and she wrote some words. And the following Sunday, she gave the words to her pastor uh, at the Hanson Place Baptist Church there in Brooklyn. She showed him what she had written a few days before. And, and the Reverend Robert Lowry, her pastor, who himself was a composer, took the words home, set them to music, added a chorus of his own, and a famous hymn was born, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Over the course of just a few days, while doing housework, one of the most touching hymns of our faith was written. And in one of the most fascinating stories in the history of hymnody, comes the story of Augustus Montague Top Lady, quite a name, but he wrote Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. You know, he wrote it in the year 1776. So while we were signing the Declaration of Independence, Top Lady was writing Rock of Ages. And the words, the words to the hymn came about one day as Top Lady was walking some distance from his home and, and suddenly a storm, a violent storm caught him out in the open and, and, and there was no shelter nearby. But this English cleric, Vicar, saw a huge cleft running down a ledge beside the road. He took refuge in that cleft and while there, thought about the spiritual significance of finding shelter in the midst of a storm. And as he thought about how God protects us from the storms of life, he looked on the ground and he saw a playing card, a playing card. And he picked the playing card up. And on the surface of the playing card, he wrote these words, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. He wrote it in the middle of a storm in a cliff. And incidentally, the playing card on which he wrote these words was a six of diamonds, a six of diamonds. So you'll never sing that song again without thinking about a six of diamonds. <laughs> oh, I, I could go on and on with these stories of the hymns, and I will next week as I come with part two, okay? I need for you to know that right up front, amazing hymns, amazing stories, part two 
because I couldn't get them all in here today. And next week, we're going to have some of the stories that will accompany our hymns. So if you've just been dying to sing Victory in Jesus, come on down next week, all right? You'll sing that and quite a few others that we have because there's some amazing stories behind those hymns. But before my time gets away from me, I want to share with you a, a personal hymn. A, a hymn that I grew up singing that you may not have, but this hymn that I want to share with you is a celebration of freedom. It's, it's the celebration of a new holiday for, for African Americans. We, we call it Freedom Day or we call it Juneteenth. You, you've seen it in the news all this week. But this hymn I want to tell you about is one that is so, so touching to the community that I come from. You, you need to hear the story. The hymn is called Lift Every Voice and Sing. Yes, you, you've heard it. You've probably done it before. It's, it's even in our Methodist hymnal. But it was written by James Weldon Johnson. You've heard that name before because I've shared with you some of his works. He was a poem, a poet. He wrote God's trombones. He, he wrote the creation. Many of you had to learn that when you were coming through school. A prolific writer, a gifted, gifted musician. And so James Weldon Johnson and his brother, J. Rosamond Johnson, were asked to do a song in commemoration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday in the year 1900. And so... James Weldon Johnson wrote the words. His brother Rosamond wrote, set it to music. And this hymn, it's a prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving, as well as a prayer for faithfulness and freedom with imagery that evokes the, the biblical exodus from, from slavery to freedom of the promised land. It is so revered in the African-American and black community that it has been called the Negro National Anthem. The Negro National Anthem. And not only did it come about as this tribute to Lincoln, but Johnson wrote the song at the request and that it would be performed by a chorus of 500 school children, African-American school children in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, the song was written, it was set to music, and it was well received. And right after that, both Johnson brothers moved to New York. And as they wrote, the song passed out of our minds. We, we forgot about the song. But the school children of Jacksonville kept singing it. They went away to other schools and sang it. They became teachers themselves and taught their children to sing it. And within 20 years, it was being sung all over the South and in other parts of the country. James Weldon Johnson writes this about this song. The lines of this song repay me in an elation, almost of exquisite anguish whenever I hear school children sing this song. This morning, I want you to just listen to the words that embody the hope, the sorrow, the agony of a march to freedom. It begins saying, lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. 
And by the time you get to the last verse of this hymn, it's almost a somber prayer-like reverence because the music itself comes down and it becomes a prayer that says, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet Stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. That song was a song of inspiration for me and people like me for many, many years and it has been adopted by the civil rights movement and many other places, and we sing that song with reverence, holy reverence. I wanted to share with that with you because I just wanted you to know that there's a, a wide, wide richness in the hymns we sing, all the way from one song to another, that you can find something in it that, that's rich, but I want to leave you this morning with a hymn of quiet courage, a hymn that renews us and replenishes us in the midst of life's struggles. It's a hymn that Jesus himself sang. We don't often think of Jesus, the singing Jesus, but it's true. It's recorded in Scripture that Jesus sang along with his disciples just before he went to face the cross. It shows us how we too can face our trials and tribulations knowing that God will not forsake us in our times of difficulty when we must bear our own cross. This hymn that I speak of is referenced in Mark's gospel. It takes place at the Last Supper table. And let me just take a moment to briefly set it up. Jesus is with his disciples, and just as we do every first Sunday, we break the bread and we give the cup. And so Jesus is saying, this is, as he broke the bread, gave thanks and blessed it, he said, this is my body given. And he took the cup and said, this is my blood given. And they participated in that act. And then when you get to Mark 14, 26, you'll find these words. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And you know what happened next. He went to Gethsemane to pray. He was arrested. He was crucified the very next day. But, but let me tell you why these hymns intrigue me. When I read that passage, the very first thing that came to my mind was, what was that hymn that Jesus sang? I got to know what was the song itself that Jesus sang on his way to the cross. And you know what? I found it. <laughs> I found the hymn because scholars Bible scholars will agree that Psalm 115 to Psalm 118 is the hymn that's always done at the conclusion of the Passover meal. And Jesus and his disciples sang this song at the conclusion of the Last Supper. And the words that they sang were the words that you heard in Scripture this morning from Psalm 118. Let me just share a few words. This is what it says in that psalm. But this is on the way to the cross. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. 
Listen, in my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me by setting me free. The Lord, get this line, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord chastened me severely but has not given me over to death. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And you've always heard this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That doesn't sound like a requiem. It doesn't sound like a funeral service. It sounds like a hymn of life, a hymn of God's assurance and his enduring love. That's what great hymns do. They remind us that God is with us in spite of what life throws at us. They put the, the ability of art and music together to tell a story of how they came through. And they gave these hymns to us and we are richer because of it and all of them all of these hymns are bound up in the faith we sing I'll see you next week for part two in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit let the church say amen <laughs>